What's up, guys? This is Pete Characters Clark, and welcome back to the Carrot Poker Podcast. I have my friend and student Ed with me on the show today. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. So we just did a did a little training session there for an hour and a half, going over some fifty and L Zoom spots, which is the game that you're you're currently playing, right? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit about your poker journey so far. It kind of intrigues me your journey actually because you're. You're a guy that's found quite a bit of initial success at an early point, and I think these days it's getting harder and harder to do that. So we'll check in with you and find out how you achieved what you've achieved so far, where you've got to, what roadblocks are still in the way, and then we're going to have a little chat later on as well on a more objective topic, which is going to be the accessibility of learning the game just by playing it and the very many ways that you can go wrong actually getting a feel for how good you are and how much progress you're making. So that sort of disconnect between your ability and your perception of your ability. So let's start off with you, Ed. So give us your poker backstory. How did you get into the game and how did you make your first initial um, money success from playing the game? So uh, I basically started out playing, like most people I imagine, like playing a few times with friends and like small home games, like five pound sit and goes or whatever. And uh, sort of realized quite quickly that I was taken to it reasonably well. And uh, I guess most people's story of like people who play a lot of poker, their stories tend to start out with, uh, you know, they ran really good in whatever session they played like really early on. And I think I've managed to avoid that trope slightly by having actually been one of the better players amongst other complete amateurs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I I then sort of like started reading strategy a bit more. And when I turned 18, I uh, deposited like 20 pounds on poker stars and... Uh, managed to run it up to a couple of hundred bucks and then didn't play very much more online um, whilst I was at university because I uh, like was very busy with work there, but still played at the University Poker Society as like, my main hobby. And then from there, like got involved with playing more live poker because a bunch of the guys played in London. And uh, yeah, basically one summer when I was working in London, I decided to play lots of live had a decent amount of success with it and then the next year when I graduated I just decided to see how far I could get with just playing poker for a living and yeah see what I could make of it and uh yeah I had sort of mi- mixed results but like uh had a big downswing right out of the gate um playing live in London and then played some in the US and had a lot more success there so decided to go out for the first three months of this year to the US went and played there and Ran really good, played quite well, the games were very good. Um, and so I managed to make a decent yeah, chunk of change. And so now I've come back and decided to focus more on playing online with the intentions of just like getting as good as I can get, moving up and trying to sort of have the opportunity to take whatever the highest uh, EV spots are, like whether that is highest stakes online or live or whatever, and just get to the point where I feel very comfortable yeah, playing whatever stakes, basically. Cool. So... You mentioned like going over to the US and playing a bunch of live poker and having a good amount of success. Just for any any hopefuls out there, what kind of um, if you don't mind me asking, chunk of change are we talking about that you were able to make just as a you know fresh out of university, like brand new professional player? So, in that three month trip, I ran very good. So I would say that this is probably not um, necessarily like something you could expect to do. Sure, but. Um, over like 400 hours of play in those three months, I made more than 20,000 pounds. And that's awesome, right? For someone who's just graduated university yeah, and I doesn't mean, have a for job. For sure. Like, I mean, because the, the other thing is like, part of the reason why I was like, this is something worth pursuing is that I, you know, was making decent money doing like playing one, two in London yeah. the summer before I graduated. And I sort of was like, oh, well, if I earn something like this, you know, playing a full time amount of hours, then I would be making about as much as a graduate job for my major, which was engineering. Yeah. But I wouldn't be paying any tax on it because I live yeah. in the UK. So I'm immediately making tw- like almost 20% more yeah. by not like by doing this rather than like a, a, a real job. And so, yeah, like being able to, I basically earned what I would have earned after tax in one of those real jobs in the first three months of the year. Cool. That's um, one of those things. Like, yes, which is like unreal. <laughs> yeah, I miss that about playing poker professionally. Like when you're teaching you're kind of like teaching other people how to make gambling winnings and you still have to pay tax because you're a teacher. There should be a rule where if you're a poker teacher, <laughs> you don't have to pay tax either because it's still all gambling winnings at well, the end of the day. Right? 
this is this is a big tangent, but there is like some interesting case law about like the tax and gambling in the UK because there was a guy who was a um, who was a, a golf pro who uh, would gamble on games with his students, and his gambling winnings weren't considered to be taxable. But obviously, he could have just charged less for the, um, you know, for his uh, coaching, yeah. and then insisted that they play him for X amount of money. Yeah, it's a bit like staking as well. If you stake somebody. I don't stake people because I'm kind of a net and I don't trust people not to have a disastrous mental game all of a sudden because they're human beings, right? But if, if I could stake a robot and it was a yeah. good robot, I would. And then I would be able to actually, I would still have to pay tax because I'm being paid via somebody else's gambling winnings. And then it's like gambling winnings aren't taxable in that case. It's just very strange, the legislation. I think it's just one of these kind of black holes of, of tax taxation law that's just been like set a certain way and just been left to rot basically is my opinion yeah right? yeah i mean i agree but like obviously it's like very advantageous for professional poker players who yeah live in the uk it makes me um, want to do it again you know like that just being reminded there of that so that must have been really nice like actually coming out of university all your friends are like battling to get their graduate job and you're making the same amount plus a bit more for not paying tax. Well, so how did people be- to be fair, when I first started out, I went most down swing playing live in London, so I was like not <laughs> not feeling so well stacked up against my uh, uh, contemporaries from university. But yeah, I think yeah after, after coming back from the US, I certainly was uh, yeah okay pretty pretty pleased with myself. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting stage then. So at this point, when you've taken the plunge, you've quit uni, much to the probably I would imagine like the the anxiety of parents or close friends or whatever. You've decided um, to go down. I don't know. I mean, so I, I, I graduated. I didn't quit uni. Um, Did I say quit uni? I meant, I meant, gra- I, I yeah, meant yeah, yeah. Graduated, graduated uni and then decided not to get a job. But like, I, d- um, I definitely didn't mean to say quit uni. If, that, if I said that, that must have been something yeah, yeah, yeah. like <laughs> for, for quitting the, the career ladder at that point or yeah. something like that. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my parents are like, they're pretty laid back. Um, but I think a lot of people were a bit like, oh, you can, you can do that. <laughs> Like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. Um, I don't know. You get you get really, really varied reactions when you tell people that you're you playing poker professionally. Um, yeah. So, like, my my girlfriend is uh, is training to be a solicitor, and apparently, when she mentions it to her colleagues that her boyfriend plays plays, pro, yeah, plays poker professionally, yeah, they're all like, "Wow, that's so cool! He's so much cooler than you. Tell me more about him." <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, like, if I tell, like, you know other people who graduated from university recently they're like huh like you know um do you actually make money at that yep <laughs> which is kind of interesting that's the question i get very often as well i remember like being at a party once and saying i probably told this story on my podcast before apologies if i sound like a broken record i remember saying to this girl she's like so you got a summer job like between uni um between years of uni i was like well kind of i play poker you know i've been making money out of it for a while and she just burst out laughing and was just like couldn't speak through laughter as if I'm just right. like this absolute idiot that just, just yeah, like, like gambling I mean, in roulette or something. I mean, it was like quite Yeah, well, that's the thing. Is like if, if you don't know that mm. poker is distinct from blackjack or roulette, then if someone's like if someone said to me, like, yeah, yeah, my summer job is I'm betting on the roulette at the casino, I'd be like, I would burst out laughing in their face probably. Yeah, yeah probably. So, like it's understandable. It's, it comes from a place of ignorance, but it's not necessarily like, I don't know. Yeah, not that bad. It's just like when the fish take your money by sucking out and making a terrible play. It comes from a place of ignorance. But we still like to get mad at them, don't we? Yeah, that's good. fair. Um, yeah, sure. So let's go back to this point in the story then where you've just um, not quit university but graduated university, taken, yeah. taken the plunge to play poker instead of looking for a job, and things have gone terribly to start with. Now, most yeah. people <laughs> in that situation are going to be like, okay, I tried, I failed, I can't handle this, let's get back on the straight and narrow ladder. So what made you persevere? That's a really good question. And I think a big part of it was that in the middle of this, like quite bad downswing playing one, two live in London, um, I took like a shorter trip to the U S um, actually to visit my girlfriend's parents cause they live out there. Right. And I sort of tagged on a week and a half of playing live in a casino in California um, before I went to go see them. And the games were ridiculously good. Um, and so I was, I'd sort of gone with the intention of playing maybe one, three and had realized that the rake is flat. So you pay the same rake at two, five as you do at one, three. Mm-hmm. And they're both games are capped at hundred big blinds. So the stakes sort of aren't that much higher, um, in terms of like bankrupt management, but like the rake is much worse at one, three. Yeah. 
So I decided to just jump into 2.5 and I was, you know, the, the edges that were possible in those games were so big that I was almost never having a losing, losing session, yeah. like over, over like a 12 hour day. I, I would play like 12 hours a day. Like I, I'm quite good at playing long live sessions. Mm-hmm. So it was just such a, you know, print basically to play in that game that I was like, well, you know, I mean, it, it, it gave me a bit of extra bankroll to be able to come back and play again um, in London. And I eventually managed to get out of the, the hole of the big downswing. So I was like, yeah, I dance, my downswing, uh, so I'm looking at my graphs now because mm-hmm. uh, you asked about how much I made in the US. Yeah. Um, my downswing went down, I went down 6,000 pounds in 200 hours okay. and then managed to get it back in the next 200 hours. Um, I ran really good on the way back up as well, but um, yeah, if I hadn't sort of gone out to the US and won like a couple of thousand bucks um, in a week in the middle of that, I think I might have got to the point where I would have just been like, yeah, hanging up my hanging up my hat and going yeah. out and getting a real job. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a common thing as well where people potential. My theory is that potential future poker greats didn't become poker greats because of how they ran in the first year of their career trying to. And that's a sad thing, but it's very normal for humans just to be like, okay, this clearly isn't working. We are results oriented creatures. We judge everything by the consequences and that's normal. But I really do think that some of the best players in the world are only in that position due to how they ran at a certain point in their career that gave them the motivation to keep going and keep learning. Because I very much think that like learning and playing are like this fluid thing where if you're running good, you have all this motivation and ambition and you're constantly thinking about new things to do and you've got all this positive energy you're discovering, you're experimenting, you're not trapped in some some stagnation where you just have the same beliefs that don't lead to success. But when you're running bad, I think it's so easy to make no progress at all because you just have all these weird beliefs and you go into a kind of box or shell. And like how you're running and how you're playing is just such a massive impact on each other. It's just such a such a relatable... Um, the concepts are so interrelated. Um, yeah. So I think that's definitely a rare thing that you were able to keep going even with the small upswing i mean six thousand like is a lot of money six thousand pounds yeah is a lot of money so downswinging that it does almost make you wonder like have i made a huge blunder and i think most people would have walked away so that's definitely an impressive thing that you didn't and it's good that also very fortunate that you ran good while you were over in the states and i mean yeah I sure i mean well. I, think, I think i ran so pretty good but like i say honestly like oh the, yeah the, the games were the games the opportunity was there you know like yeah, yeah. i mean um, I, I saw that once when I played a game and um another one of my random anecdotes and this guy limps in under the gun i iso and he just folds ace king face up says you got yeah. me i mean this kind of play you don't ever see that online anymore it's just like this crazy little bubble that's trapped in the past right like some of these games yeah in the us because they don't have um online poker like yeah sometimes you just see, like because it's people who've been taught by only several hundred hands you know because yeah. that's all that they can play in the free time that they are afforded to go to the casino yep and speaking um, of which that was going to be our topic for today as well um we'll come back to that in a minute let's just finish off your poker story first and then we'll talk about how that delusion of only playing a few hundred hands can really give you a warped sense of reality in this game and how dangerous that can be for your career and whether you make it or not we'll come back yeah. to it so on the note of what you did next you came home and then you hired me and started playing online games so you, you started off with 25 nl zoom is that right yeah that's correct uh played like a couple of you know tens of thousands of pounds to have a bit of a sample to talk about um and ran fairly break even um thought i was sort of you know probably slightly beating the stakes mm-hmm. and then we had our first coaching session i played another couple of ten thousand hands and um had had a big upswing so i was like okay i think i'm beating this now <laughs> but yeah obviously lots of leaks and lots of stuff to look at and then uh yeah so i guess we had probably about i guess maybe a month and a half two months of coaching sessions yeah um and then um i about sort of i guess four weeks ago just got back from a month in southeast asia um so i took a month off to go do some traveling um, which was good because, I mean, coincided with uh, some friends of mine who were doing the same thing. And uh, obviously, it's one of the big upsides of, you know, being self-employed in general, but yeah. being a poker player in particular, you can just take whatever time off whenever you feel like it. It's the best part. It's just like, I'm going to have a holiday. There's nothing you guys can do about it because I'm going to yeah. you when I get back. Best thing ever. Yeah, Or when exactly. I'm playing, same thing. 
Um, good. So, so since so I remember you showing me a graph quite recently at twenty five and Ellen. Honestly, it was one of the more impressive graphs I've seen because not only was your graph good in the sense that you had a huge win rate, and I I plugged your win rate into a variance calculator to see yeah. how well you were doing and to see what the chances were of you just being on like the sickest heater imaginable yet being a very small winner. And it came back and said like microscopic, like less than 1% chance that this guy is not like a very big winner in the game because even though you'd only played maybe 40,000 hands or something, yeah. the win rate was like 18 bigs per 100 or something absurd, right? It was like something huge. And yeah. you can run like that for a few thousand hands. You can do that for 10,000 hands if you're lucky. The chances of being that one guy in like... I don't know, a thousand that actually runs like that and is only a small winner is microscopic. So you're almost certainly a very strong poker player relative to those to the pool. And that's not, not all thanks to me. I mean, hopefully the coaching's helped you, but it's you know, I could tell you're a very strong player when you first um turned up on day one, you had the good foundations and the good logic and the problem solving and things mm. like that. So I think it's definitely fair to say that you've got a fair bit of natural ability and that's always a good thing for a poker player. But yeah. What did you do study wise, like to hone that ability and get the results to twenty five and L to move up to fifty? What kind of study and hard work did you find you had to put in when you transitioned from these really soft US live games to obviously the twenty five and L pool, which is a lot tougher and the win rate's a lot a lot lower? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question actually, because I was gonna say like you, you sort of said it was like a natural aptitude, but I think I I have a, like a reasonable set of um, talents for poker in general but I think a big part of it is just that I love the game and I love studying strategy and like I'm happy to just spend hours online just like I like, have an idea about a particular spot like just trying to find everything I can find that's been written about it or said about it or you know always looking for like free coaching content or anything that I can just absorb so like until I got coaching from you I had ne like never had a subscription to any kind of training site um I'd spent like a very small amount of money on software. Like I bought Power Equilab, mm -hmm. never used a solver, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like I think, yeah, probably the most important thing was just, yeah, being like, there's so much information out there online for free. If you're just willing to go out and find it. And if you love the game and you love learning about it, then, you know, there's tons of opportunity for you to improve that way. And then now that I'm actually sort of trying to go from like 25 zoom was basically the, the lowest stakes where I felt like I could, like, you know, I wouldn't care too much if I lost the money, but I would care enough if I won the money that I would feel pretty invested in it. Yeah. Like, and that the rake is sort of high, but, you know, um, not, you know, not as bad as like, you know, 10 and L and 5 and L, the rake is really tough to beat. Yes, yeah, terrible um, 10 and L, a lot of my students, like, who have potential, who just aren't quite accurate enough, get stuck in that, that net, and it's a real shame because... They could just yeah. play twenty five and L, and then with a few more coaching lessons, probably, probably just beat it and move up. So yeah, don't don't nece unnecessarily play five and ten and L if you've got experience. The rake will destroy you. I think mean, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, and destroy your confidence as well, right? Because yeah. if you're, you know, if you're playing those games and you're, you know, seeing lots of your opponents making lots of mistakes, but like you run a little bit under EV and the rake is really high, like you're actually beating your opponents by a really wide margin, but after rake, you might only be beating it by a few big blinds per 100, and running a, a couple of big blinds per 100 under EV is really yeah. easy. Yeah, definitely, and there's so many types of running under EV. People talk about all in EV, like it's the only EV, like, oh, look, I'm mm. running bad in EV. People say, that's not EV, that's just like your EV when your cards were flipped over. And yeah, that's just the one that we, we know is mathematically accurate. <laughs> there's yes. all these other ones which, like, uh, yeah, the graph can't really, uh, can't really show. No, one day we will create there will be a tracking program that creates like sets flopped compared with like average sets flopped and you'll be able yeah, to like, but look at my party on poker tracker. You can see if you've, been, if you've been making fewer sets and flushes and strokes, yeah. they have one tool for that. But, but it's like good the sample graph. sizes are always too small, so it's kind of not that useful. Yeah, and you need a graph. You need a purple line and a brown line and a gray line with all these other yeah. variants. Yeah. Right, <laughs> don't you? Like that's, that's my dream. Like we will to see like all of the variants and wade through it all and make ourselves feel so much better about yeah, and you just you just see like your EV adjusted line, and it's just like perfectly straight. Yeah. <laughs> over like you know tiny samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I I don't I don't think that uh, I don't think we necessarily want that, but yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I think it would give a lot of people peace of mind, but the, I think it's the lesson here is don't obsess over like a particular type of variance. Try and see variance as a very like 
yeah. there's very many I mean, different types of it basically and you should look into all of them if you're going to actually look at it but maybe ignore it and just have a general vague sense of how you're running but that's difficult <laughs> isn't it like to know exactly how well you're actually running because if you're a yeah. losing player it probably feels like you're running bad all the time because your losses yeah. always outweigh your wins so it's the yeah. I mean, yeah, like, I think that's also an important bit of advice if you're going to play much live poker, because understanding variance in live poker is, you know, another order of magnitude more difficult again, because you never have a significant sample. And yeah, you just, it's just so easy to fixate on like particular hands where you get coolered or you get sucked out on whatever. Yeah. And it might be that you've been flopping pairs or draws or, you know, getting your C-Vets through way, way more than you should have been. But you yeah. have no real way of gauging that because you see so few hands. And on, on our topic of population reads that are, or just any kind of analysis of how well things work or how well you're doing that's based off of results, which is basically what we're going to talk about here, um, that's a big part of it as well. There are different players, all winning players, maybe good players, experienced players, and lesser players too, who have very varying... Um, conceptions of what is a good line in the against the population and what's not for example some student may say to me something like they always raise when they check in this spot and i'll be like no they don't like i've like sweated hundreds of thousands of hands played hundreds of thousands of hands yeah. in these pools like i know how the pool plays i've seen enough variants to know that they do not always check raise you when they check the flop as a pre-flop raiser yet this student has played ten thousand hands and that's come up a lot of times just by chance and now he's got a terrible deluded population read about the pool so that's something i see a hell of a lot yeah i mean yeah i mean over ten thousand hands like ten thousand hands feels like a lot of hands like especially if you play live like yes you know if you're if you're getting like so i went on a downswing recently when i just moved up to 50 and i was getting like check raised on the river by tight players yep. that was one of the things i noticed so much and i was starting to think you know you know, have have the the tight regs at fifty worked out that people overfold to river check raises, which they do probably, yes, because it sure. looks so strong for sure. Um, like not necessarily, but probably, yeah. And so I was trying to work out whether I thought that I was just running into it all the time, or if it was actually something that I needed to start adjusting to. And you know, when it happens to you frequently over a stretch of ten thousand hands, like it feels like it's happening all the time. Oh yeah. And like that, that you know, it feels like an awful lot of hands, but yeah, in reality. You know, 10,000 hands in the scheme of things is not enough to build up a read on a spot that's actually, you know, relatively low frequency, right? Well. Say seeing, that, a, yeah. seeing a river even is relatively low in 10,000 hands, you know? Yeah, it's when you filter for flopsy bet over 10,000 hands, you get a bunch of hands and you're like, okay, I have some data about this guy's flopsy bet. Then you look at turnsy bet and you're like, ah, not yeah. so sure about this, you know, like 46 out of 98 or whatever, like it's not great. And then you filter for river sea bet and it's like, 12 out of 31 and you're just like wow that could mean anything at all and you yeah. almost have no sample over 10k on a triple spot so raised on the river divide that yeah. by four or five again and you're yeah. talking about a few times that's come up over 10k hands and it is so so um but if you're having to make lots of these sort of bet folds mm. where you you know it's in situations where you you know are very accustomed to making them because people are gonna be quite strong but you know they, they crop up all the time you're starting you're gonna start questioning it you know, even though it is in reality a very small number of times, but they, they will stick out quite a lot. Yeah, you remember the times when a, a weird, horrible thing happened to you. You don't remember the times that you just bet the river and the net folded. They just folded, just part, yeah. Of course, yeah. It's weird. Well, it's just, a bit like, yeah. There's a bit in Peep Show, actually, where, um, I don't know if you ever watched Peep Show, but... Yeah, I like Peep Show. Um, yeah, it's a great, great show. So um, yeah. Mark Corrigan, David Mitchell, is, is asking this hippie girl, Nancy, like she's gone on, she makes a point like, well, what about all the buses that made it safely to their destinations that day? Why does the news not talk about them? And Mark was like, well, of course, Nancy, the world should just be an inordinate, inordinate list of all the pointless events that happened in the day. But to get a real perspective on how often <laughs> yeah. buses crash, you do need such a list. And that's the thing in poker. Like, yeah. you don't ever remember the times the bus made it safely to its destination because it's too boring. And you don't remember the time the reg checked you and you bet the flop and he folded because he's not protecting his checking range as a pre-flop raiser. We know this is a population read in the micros. That's true. So why does my student think they check raise a lot? Because he only remembered the check raises. They probably folded 20 times more often than they check raise, but he ignored every single one of them. So selective memory is another big thing that even if you have a big sample, it's still very yeah. possible to be deluded about the, what's going on in the pool. Yeah. I mean, I guess like you can sort of relatively easily remedy that at least with you know, if you have a, if you do have a big sample, you can then just you know jump into your poker tracker and you know run some filters. Yeah. Be like, oh, oh no, actually, you know, the pools. You know, you can just look at the the stats for all the players and average them and uh, say, yeah, the pool is only actually check raising the flop. 
yeah. you know, 7% of the time or whatever it probably is. For sure. And so you can sort of, you know, remedy that. But like I said, if you're playing, if you're only playing small volumes, like you have a bunch of students, for example, who are like, you know, have a regular day job and they're playing in their evenings, maybe yeah. like an hour or two, a couple of evenings a week. Like if they're four tabling regular speed tables, like I know a couple of the guys do that, for example. Yeah. They're, they're playing very few hands a week or a month. Yeah. Like, you know, maybe maybe only ten thousand hands a month. Yeah. Um, some of these guys. Like, it's gonna be really hard for them to not get, you know, jaded by certain situations that they have got a bit of a, an anomalous sample going on. And it must be worse when you were playing live as well and you were going through that downspring live. I mean, I'm just trying to place myself there. Um, at that point in my career when I just graduated university, so at that young kind of fresh point in life when you're still very influenceable by all of the things around you um even in the areas you know the best like poker and I'm, I'm trying to like think how would i react to that kind of horrible variance um so how deluded do you think you got about the population's trends about your own ability and like how much to what extent did like fears and anxiety play into your your game at that point when you were running bad in london yeah i don't really know i mean i i remember i remember being sort of pretty down about it um, because also like the first couple of weeks um, I was I was playing at Asper's Casino in Stratford in East London which is probably the least glamorous casino in London mm. um, and it's not it's not the most pleasant place to be and you know there are lots of quite sort of bitter regulars there and it's like yeah it's not it's not a really good environment for like your state of mind in general yeah and I was just going in and I was just losing two buy-ins every day for like two weeks or you know something like that and it was just complete carnage and i i remember sort of thinking like you know i can't win like as in you know like i would um double barrel with a flush draw and make a flush on the river and shove and the guy would tank and tank and tank and he'd call and he'd call me with the second nut flush yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and i would just be like you know how is it there are these people who are thinking with second nuts and then you know some other hand i you know um, flop a combo draw with seven six of diamonds and triple barrel on a bricked out board because it's obviously the best bluff I have because I have seven high and they call me with you know no longer top pair from the flop and it's just like you know when, when you're really running into it on like both sides of the coin it, it really does feel like there's just no winning yeah. um, and I don't I don't know if I I basically I, I think some of the reads that I developed were probably accurate. Mm. Like the guy from that second hand where he called me down with no longer top pair, like he his view was I'm a young person, I'm aggressive, so he's just not falling a pair to me. Online kids. So yeah. yeah, exactly. So and he was like an older, beardy, middle aged guy. And you know, and he was a he was a regular. He played there every day, like six or eight hours or something. Yeah. And, you know, in the long term, having that read from losing that hand is like really valuable and he's probably never going to change that perspective on me you know no matter no number no matter the number of times that i turn up with the goods like triple barreling against him he's still going to keep like paying me off the top pair because his his read will be so cemented yep um yeah, but i'm true. the aggressive guy who shoved on him with seven high that one time and likewise the guy who tanked with the queen high flush like i can make him fold his entire range in any situation where he's uncapped because he's thinking about folding the second nuts um so yeah i think um it you can still you can still if you if you know that what you're doing is good like i think i didn't feel too tilted or put out by that stretch for the most part because i was just pretty confident that i was playing a like very reasonable game yeah. i was more concerned with the quality of the games that i was playing in because i was playing daytimes at this like not so great casino and I was just a little bit concerned that it was like lots of these very break even, slightly losing people who were there to sort of play in the loyalty free roll tournament at the end of the month and getting points for that. Yeah, and so your win rate. The, like the opportunity wasn't there. I wasn't worried that I wasn't good enough or that I like, you know, didn't, I hadn't uh, developed any population reads, but I was more worried that also the rate was slightly higher because they have a free roll. So they take like, you know, an extra you know, pound or something from the pot every once in a while. So, like, between the rake and the game quality, I was more worried that I was in a bad spot than that I was playing badly, I guess. Okay, so next question. You've described the dingy unpleasantness of that environment. What mm. do you find is more conducive to having a balanced 
I guess, mental game, mental health outlook as a poker player? Would you rather, do you prefer sitting in more active, upbeat environments like in, in the US playing in casinos there? Or do you prefer sitting at home and playing online in the Zoom pool from the comfort of your own place? So now that I am in my own place, I think playing online has definitely got some benefits. Um, I was playing mostly like uh, in my family home and with like, there's always someone at home and there's always distractions and the internet connection is not very good because we live in the middle of nowhere. And I thought that like that was not really an environment that was conducive to, because ultimately, you know, poker, playing poker, like playing your absolute best is it's quite a high performance thing. Oh yeah. Uh, and like, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's not, it's not like when you have a day job, you just, you know, you go in and you do your tasks for the day and like, maybe you have to really focus at certain times, but for the most part, you know, it's just sort of fairly, you know, you plod along. Whereas with poker, like you really do need to be firing on all cylinders for the majority of the time you're there at the tables. So, um, I think that, that environment was pretty poor for that. Uh, now I'm in my own flat and I've got my own setup and an internet connection that's a bit more reliable. <laughs> um, like this is really good for me. Um, but I, I really enjoy playing live in the US actually. Um, I, I, I like, I'm quite a personable person. So I like hanging out with people, I like chatting to them and you meet a pretty varied range of characters at a poker table anywhere and in the US in particular. That's for sure. Um, and obviously not all of them are great conversation or whatever, but if you're sort of willing to have a chat with people like, you know, generally, generally people who, who are there, they're there to have a bit of a laugh. Um, so it's usually a pretty good environment. Um, though I guess one of the big downsides is eating casino food all the time. It's not very good for you. <laughs> yeah. Like steak sandwich and chips, basically potato wedges. Yeah. Been there. Yeah, exactly. MGM yeah, brand and, food every day. And like, yeah, exactly. And sitting in like these sort of, yeah, not very uh, ergonomic chairs for long hours and all that kind of stuff is, it's not not great for you. You don't like really terrible budget office chairs, no? I thought that would no, be, that would no. Be right I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite not not for not for a twelve hour session every no. day for a month. <laughs> I say that to students, you know, make sure you cut out your place, have peace and quiet, don't have like a distraction. The worst poker environment I ever had. I had an office mm -hmm. chair, wasn't very comfortable. At a desk, but I would play poker all day for a job in the same room that my girlfriend at the time would do all of her work for a PhD in. Um, right. that was terrible because she's, she was not the sort of person that would like work quietly everything was a monologue you know everything was thought out loud and I would get so tilted and I'd be having a winning session I'd just be like I am furious why am I so tilted I'm annoyed <laughs> yeah. at everything people are doing it's because I'm constantly getting distracted every two seconds I think a lot of poker players aspiring poker players as well make the mistake of just playing at home and because they're at home they're like I don't have to create any professional kind of boundaries here I can just do whatever I want and when you have like your family around you and if there's kids in the family, especially or dogs or whatever, man, it's just impossible and it wears out your willpower to have a good mental game so, so fast. So I think that's yeah, a good definitely. point. And life yeah, well. I, I actually probably got the most tilted that I got during this dance swing when I was playing, like sat on the sofa in my living room um, with my mum there watching the TV yeah. and she's watching some Scandinavian drama. And, you know, like I think it's Danish. Danish is a very percussive language. So it was there like you know, playing away and it was giving me a headache. And then she was like asking me pointless questions every 10 minutes whilst I was trying to focus on what I was doing. And yeah. honestly, I rage quit the session, like completely unrelated to what was happening on the table just yeah. because I found the distractions so, so aggravating. Definitely. You have to be in a flow as um, well, which is why live, when I play live, I'm not that, I mean, I'm a sociable enough person, but I'm not really like outgoing. I wouldn't say I'm like kind of like semi-reserved, maybe somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. But when sure. I'm playing live, I actually feel like being more outgoing because if I don't get into a flow of interacting, I'm just letting my brain like decay and rot because I'm playing like what, 30 hands an hour. I'm involved yeah. in two of them or something yeah. when I'm card dead. And then I'm yeah. just sitting there like, and you can just see the mold growing over the brain and then you can't even think anymore about poker. So I think you have to live as well, make an effort to speak to people and find the people at the table that you enjoy the company of. Cause if you don't, you just end up like just not wanting to be there at all. So poker environment yeah, sure. is huge. It's definitely like a, a really big thing and I can see why at that point in your story like being in those dingy places while there's daylight outside it's not seeping into the place you're in because it's a casino and you just walk out of there at like I don't know like seven eight o'clock at night down a grand every day man I would have yeah. gone I would have gone crazy but it looks like looks like it worked anyway the perseverance paid off you have to sometimes go through huge huge turmoil downswings in this game 
before you get a break. In fact, I remember a year of my career when I played professionally before I started coaching too much when I ran so badly for the start of the year and so well for the end of the year. Like, I mean, like first five months, latter seven months, that it was just like, you would not believe you were playing in the same game with the same amount of possible variance. It's just insane how students can go like that. Um, And I was actually talking to a student the other day who was saying, we were talking about the fact that there are lifetime run bad players and lifetime run like good players. And that's how sick this game is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, even, yeah, like if, if, if you think about it, someone has to be at the tails of the distribution. Yeah. There has to be someone who's in the top 0.1% and someone who's in the exactly. bottom 0.1%. Yeah. But it's just, you know, you know uh, sort of the law, law of large numbers. Exactly. There's going to be someone who is actually running, you know, lifetime 20 big blinds per 100 above EV. There will be. Like and somebody's going to be running 20 big blinds, uh, you know, below. Exactly. But probably the latter person doesn't play anymore. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. And that's what I meant when I said that potential big winners don't exist due to being on the wrong end, being on the tail of that of that distribution. It's like the young person who randomly just gets like the really rare disease that only exists in older people, but they get it when they're young because somebody has to that's that age. And it's the same yeah. thing run bad. Like somebody has to actually get that kind of terrible variance. And the guy that wins the yeah. lottery is analogous, you know, to the guy that basically runs like God all of his life. And I, I do think that if it wasn't for 2010, and how I ran, because my mental game was in tatters at that point. Like, I did not have a strong mental game when I first started playing poker seriously. I knew I was good. Like, I knew I had a big edge against the average reg because I understood the game better and I knew in forums that I was one of the stronger posters and things like that. But when it came to playing, I don't know. I think if I'd ran bad or average in 2010, there's a very good chance I would never be a professional poker player, coach, author. The Grinders Manual probably would never have existed. 100 Hands would never have existed. Subtle plug. Boom. And yeah. I wouldn't be talking to you right now in this interview. So it just yeah. goes to show if you are going through a time like that and you feel like you can't win anything, it might be because you're not a good poker player yet and you need to work loads in your game, you need coaching and things like that. Or it might be that you're actually a winner and you just can't win right now. I think a good place to go is pokerdope.com variance calculator for me. Like that just gives mm-hmm. you a nice sense of, it won't tell you if you're the guy on that tail end of the distribution or not, but it'll tell you what the chances are of that actually being the case. And yeah. in most cases, you should assume that you run somewhere within a normal range um otherwise yeah. you'll go insane i don't think there's anyone yeah. out there that believes they've ran like god for all of their poker career i think the guys that have no. probably don't believe so yeah i mean yeah i think um you have to be careful with that though because if you look at like what the what the poker variance calculator says about live poker and how many hands you can play in a year in live poker it, it'll make you sort of lose your mind a bit yeah because like I think I looked at it when I had like so I might have even been overestimating overestimating my win rate because this was after I'd run reasonably well for a summer and not after I'd had this big downswing and managed to get back out of the hole. Like I looked at it and it was like basically it was like a ten or fifteen percent chance that I break even over the entire year, mm-hmm. which is you know that that's really like terrifying. Like obviously the flip side is you know you could make you know ten or fifteen percent of the time you're going to make twice the yeah. salary, but like yes i mean that is not not low enough for you to not be concerned about it oh yeah totally i mean if someone told you there's a 10 percent chance you will make no money this year you would be absolutely terrified of how you were going to survive and yeah i mean the stresses which is why this is why i do this this is why i coach and things like that there's some variance in it there's better months there's worse months you know there's book sales go up and down with the season but at the end of the day you are not going to make nothing for a year and that's pretty comforting to know so what i do say to other students is that if they're doing really well i say you know what like it's great to be a 200 nl zoom grinder and like you know churn out 60 70 grand in a year doing that or something or more but at the same time have a think about the more stable ways that this game can can give you a living as well that you can't just make a you can just be a professional poker player obviously but you can also explore other options like teaching and it depends how good you are at that, of course, but there's other things related to poker you can do with your poker skills, and that's like one thing yeah. that always gave me comfort was that I don't have to do this forever. That's what I used to say to myself um, when yeah. I would grind out like 100 NL or 200 NL, like for like 100k a month or something. I'd be like, I will not be able to do this forever mentally, and I don't have to thank God because there'll be other things I can do with this skill, and that's a yes. cool thing as well. If you make it like nosebleeds, though, then you can just like make all your money in one year and then just retire. I mean, that would be nice too. It's worth a shot. Yeah. That's actually the other thing I was going to say about running really good and running really bad. Yeah. In fact, I mentioned before this um, 
this poker goals and challenges thread from this post called Mix Grill. Um, his screen name is not in the like his poker star screen name is not in the thread, but he's one of the top players online at the moment, and he uh, he made a million dollars in the last year playing online on um, various sites, I think. And you know, like I started following his thread maybe two years ago, and it, like it's really good inspirational reading if you want to see like what is the like absolute maximum possible in poker right now. Yeah online playing cash and um you know two years ago he made sort of several hundred thousand dollars and i was like wow that's you know there's still there's still potential in poker even oh, yeah. today you know, even cool. though the high six doesn't really run that much yeah but the year in between between when he was making a few hundred k and between this year where he's made a million he made 47k or something at the tables which is obviously you know it's good salary if you're a student or something but like that difference between those years is terrifying. Absolutely. And his game didn't change dramatically, presumably over those years. Maybe he played a bit better when he was running good than when he was running bad, but that's just variance. That's single-handedly variance. I mean, absolutely. And also that he just ran absolutely the worst to absolutely the highest stakes. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's actually you know, hard when, to even When see. the highest stakes only run from time to time. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like all your volume that you play lower almost becomes like nullified, doesn't it? In that situation. Yeah. Yeah. I used to work with a guy, um, as in teach, a poker player, um, who's very good. He was one of the better players I would say on the East Coast of America at the time. Mike Selby, not caught up with him in a while. Um, won't mention his name here, but he would make like hundred and ten, hundred and forty, hundred and sixty. Like these would be like the kind of years that you would have, and we looked at a variance calculator once, and we found that there was something like a seventy percent chance that his earnings would be between eighty thousand and one hundred eighty thousand in one year. Mm -hmm. A seventy percent chance with a one hundred thousand dollar threshold between yeah. the minimum and the maximum, and then a thirty percent chance that it's out with that. That's just insane. Like, how do you plan your life and like your house and the size of your mortgage around this kind of data? That's the instability yeah. of the game, but. I guess yeah. you don't complain when it's between 80 and 180. A bit more scary yeah, when it's quite. between 0 and 80. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, that, that's exactly the thing. Yeah, it's that, that's the kind of situation that I'm in. And I have actually just bought a flat and I now do have a mortgage. But yeah. I, I am in a sort of fairly uniquely lucky situation where um, my girlfriend makes quite good money. Yeah. So the stress is totally off me. And basically the way she sees it is, you know, she would otherwise be paying rent in London, which is crippling. <laughs> And Absolutely. so she'd rather be paying off a mortgage. And uh, if, you know, if she has to pay it, then she'll own more of the house. And then if I win the Sunday million, then I can pay the whole thing off. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I think, you know, I'm very, very fortunate to be in that situation where I don't have to necessarily worry about it too much. And also, like, I graduated with a decent degree. So if I have to get a real job, it's not going to be the end of the world, you know. For sure. And I mean, you've got money behind, you know, I mean, most people that graduate uni just haven't got like 25 grand that they've won from online poker sitting there as a buffer that they can use as a deposit true the house that but that's the yeah, that's that's not now all the deposit that's that's the problem but not it's all still of it, like a big chunk of it <laughs> yeah but it's ex it still exists just in a different form you know it's not like that's true yeah from you so i mean it's a big thing and like that's one of the things that and i look around and i look at like friends and stuff who have gone down more conventional routes and they just work so much more than me do you know what i'll let you into a little secret here man they age more than me. Like, I look at my friends, I don't want to sound <clears> out, <throat> right? I don't want to, like, sound like, oh, I'm so young and, and beautiful and, and sprightly. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I'm 32, right? I'm not, like, as young as I was. But when I look at my friends who are 32, the difference is that for the last 10 years, I've been sitting in this chair or a similar chair, swiveling around, drinking a cup of tea, looking at some fish swim by and spouting some stuff about implied odds and, yeah. and actually getting told what to do by someone working eight-hour days. I've been working, like, four-hour days, five-hour days. That kind of thing. I love Bertrand yeah. Russell, right? He's my favorite philosopher. And he once said that there's really no actual legitimate reason for the world with all of its resources and all of its productivity for people to be working eight or 10 hours a day. It's just crazy. Like there should be way more leisure time, basically, with his outlook as a major hedonist. And like, I'm, I read that and I was like, yeah, I don't want to work eight or 10 hour days, five days a week. Like, screw that. So I look around and I see people who have been doing that and I swear to God they must age like 50% faster or something like that like yeah. in the empirical evidence so that's another bonus about being in a gig like this where you play a game that you love and you have all the freedom and stuff you just I think you probably live longer as long as you're not playing nosebleeds and have a heart attack that's the downside I guess when you're yeah. too high under rolled yeah I think um, 
the uh, someone actually made a joke about like the stress of playing the nosebleeds uh, in this uh, thread that I was talking about, yeah. and the guy said. Uh, thank God I'm bald, so I don't have to go grey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine that's a pretty pretty good analysis. <laughs> Definitely, and I think I think part of my choice to be a to be more on the the writing and teaching side more recently is just that I kind of like my hair being black, like it's kind of nice. Mm-hmm. So, um, for sure, a big a big deal there as well. Um, but yeah. like, let's talk a little bit about that then. So going forward here, do you see poker now? as being it for the next five or ten years or are you still in a kind of trial period where you're not sure if you'll go back to a conventional source of making a living um i think it, eventually i'm gonna have to go back to yeah i mean I'm, i don't think poker can possibly be a forever thing um you know not not for my lifetime but um like i, I think it, i don't think it'd be the worst thing in the world if it if it happens to be sustainable to yeah do something like coaching or, or writing or whatever like i think i would be more than happy doing something like that but i think more realistically it's going to be a see how far i can get and when i feel like oh, i'm hitting some kind of a ceiling or or if i just got on a massive downswing that takes me out of the game which is also a thing that could potentially happen mm. then i will you know either get like a sort of fairly normal office job or I would prefer to like get involved in a startup or something like that, which again gives me a bit of freedom. It's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit yeah. more stimulating, a bit riskier as well, I guess. In a way, I'm probably sort of slightly risk seeking. Um, For sure. I mean, a lot of us are. But yeah, I think you kind of have to be. Mm. I would bet um, that you won't be able to get rid of the the poker bug, and if you try going back to an office job, there'll be this little thing inside your head. It's like, you know is this really what you want to do? And it'll be there every day until you just end up finding a way to make poker your thing. I think it's just that kind of game. That's not like a hundred percent prediction. I just think a lot of people who are successful at this game and then try to work a normal job end up coming back to it in one way or another, because it just offers so much freedom and interest and just like, I wouldn't miss it. Like I get sick of it sometimes. I'm like, I can't believe I have to do another like range bet versus polarize your range on the flop textual lesson today. I've done so many of them. I can't be arsed with this. By the end of the yeah. day, if I go on holiday for a week and a half or 10 days oh, yeah. and I come back, I'm actually like, I love this game. Like I can't yeah. wait to like do my first lesson or, you know, write my first article yeah. or whatever. When I get back, I'm like into it. So it's just like, I think it's yeah. really hard to go back into like a normal career that comes with a lot of like, sort of not using your creative brain time, just doing tasks, like whatever. Admin, yeah. if you work in, if you do work as um, engineering, so there's loads of different jobs you get out of that, but every one of them will come with some kind of idle time where your brain is doing a task it knows how to do and isn't particularly interested in, just has to grind it out for the money. Poker, yeah. it kind of doesn't ever do that because if you're in the right frame of mind and you stay inspired, you're always able to to make it very interesting. I, yeah. think, I think that's what I love about it the most. I think if you're if you're 24 tabling micros and that's how you're trying to make a living, yeah. then it is kind of a bit more like, um, you know, of an automatic procedural thing. Yeah. But I think it, if, like me, you're focusing on two tabling zoom and like quality over quantity and trying to make the best possible decision at every point, you know, it's, it's pretty um, intellectually stimulating and keeps you very focused. Um, Though I would also say um, on the like having the poker bug thing, when you were saying about, oh, you know, lots of people would have quit after mm-hmm. like the downswing. I was thinking actually that this summer when I was playing in London, I actually had an internship in a finance company. And basically, you know, I had a full time job and, that, you know, the hours were pretty reasonable, but sort of slightly on the longer side. But I was still going and playing every evening and every weekend because yeah. um, I was within walking distance of the casinos in Leicester Square. Yeah. And... Um, I was basically getting more and more into the poker and less and less into the job. And like I was spending, you know, I was, I was really starting to push it with like, oh, this is a ridiculously good game. I know I have work in six hours, but I'm going to stay another two hours. Yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely like it would, you would, you would get sort of pulled back in, but like that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world either. You know, if I, if I'd gone completely busto at the bottom of the downswing, then I would have gone and got, you know, a real job and then probably, been able to still keep playing a bit on the side yeah. but with the buffer of having money coming in every month that's true um, i mean yeah, which isn't true. the worst thing in the world i mean would, would you say that for people who want to people who are really really into poker what would be your advice whether they should try and do it alongside a job or if they should try and like really start like focus all of their time on it yeah it's a really good question i think they need to basically be quite um cautious 
until they have experienced enough of playing poker full time, not full time, but like playing long hours, playing the game through bad swings, experience, experiencing all the game has to throw at you, downswing wise, variance wise, before you make that decision. I think by far the biggest mistake that you see very often is a player who's been on a heater for 50,000 hands and is just packs a job in and of kind of impulse and then ends up like, actually, I would say nine times out of 10, their mental health gets battered so hard by actually trying to like fight through downswings when they thought they were a crusher and they just find out like on the topic of today's podcast that they're just so far away from where they thought they were in terms of in terms of win rate that mm-hmm. it messes them up like really badly. So I think if you're really into this game and you love it and you find yourself spending all your time on it anyway and thinking about it all the time, you should look towards doing it if you don't like the alternative or there's not a very lucrative alternative. It depends obviously what people's career options are what kind of salary they could make, what kind of enjoyment and lifestyle they would get out of the alternative, i.e. the real world job. But the main thing I'd say is just don't jump into it until you've experienced most of the things the game has to throw at you because when you are running great over 50 or 100,000 hands and you're making 10, 20, 30 grand and it's very, very easy at that point to think that's the way it's always going to be and it's not. So don't burn bridges because of good variance. That would be my main lesson. But sure, I can't tell you not to follow that dream because that's what I've done and it's worked out. So definitely try to try to go with, you know, follow your heart basically when it comes to poker. If it's what you love, you need to try and do it, I think, if you love it that much, but gradually and safely and not impulsively. Yeah. Though so actually, um, yeah, when you're saying that sort of having like, you know, other options and other ways of like money coming in, like I was talking to a friend of mine who plays a lot live in London and he was saying that it's, quite important and you're saying that you don't stake people because you're a bit of a nit about it but like you're yeah. saying it's important to take opportunities to buy people's action and play soft tournaments when they crop up and things like that because you know sometimes the ev is very high and although they're high variance like you know when you get those windfalls they're such yeah. a boom to your yeah. um to your bankroll that you can't really pass up on them it's actually so something you're doing it sufficiently frequently yeah it's something i've been considering recently i've actually been looking at the big events are coming to the UK, like yeah. the, for example, like the Genting and Grosvenor, like poker tours, and like what the bigger events of them are. And I've actually made a point. I've said to myself as a kind of summer resolution of part way through the year resolution of such a thing exists that I will play a few of these before the end of the year. I'll go away for the weekend, play cash on the side, and actually like try and re fall in love with like the kind of glamorous sort of have a big score aspect of the game because. They are super high AV for guys like us that have spent so, so much time and hard work working on our game. Why wouldn't we want to take our shots at these very, very favourable lotteries? Of course we do. And we're not talking about field sizes of 50,000 players. We're talking about fields that you can regularly win in with an edge and things like that. So I think it's a big thing. Like If you do consider yourself a strong online player, don't just draw the line at him an online player. Do look at other things as well. It's something I've been guilty of and it's something I've wanted to fix. So who knows, maybe a bunch of us can meet up in the UK um, from the Car- the Carrot Corner Forum and actually play some big events or something this year that might be cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, though I definitely feel like I am not at all specialised towards that sort of short stack, shovel fold stuff that you need for a lot of these tournaments. It'd be a lot easier yeah. to learn, though, than all the stuff you've learned so far and like GTO and six max cash ranges and things like that. I think it would be a walk in the park. In comparison, yeah. not to say that tournament play can get very complicated, but learning a solid push or fold strategy that's good enough to to do well in these events with your edge or the other stages or the deeper stages is definitely not going to be like a huge ordeal. I wouldn't think, and it's probably worth doing, like you say. Anyways, yeah. we better um, wrap up for now. So, final <laughs> question: Do you have aspirations to play very high stakes in the next couple of years, or would you be happy just sort of earning a good living at like one hundred NL Zoom? That's a really good question. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't think I would be happy just, put, you know, grinding 100 NL forever. Yeah. Um, I, or, you know, not that it would be forever, but you know, for the next year or two years, whatever. I would definitely want to be playing 200 NL and you know, taking shots at 500 and you know, game selecting like 1K reg speed tables. Sure. Um, and to be honest, like, I see myself. Yeah, wanting to, you know, go out and play the big live games in the US, like playing like 1025 and stuff cool. in Vegas and on the East Coast. Um, that would be more like my aspirations. And, you know, if 
if I feel like I can get there, then yeah, I would probably, you know, like to play the highest stakes that run online. If I can, that's all. But yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think that's a realistic thing a year from now. But I think if a year from now I'm sort of knocking on the door of all of my more realistic goals, I would definitely be looking at potentially playing like the highest stakes that I can. Yeah, and it'll also depend like how much the deck hits you in the face. Like I think there's something to be said for you have to, if you have big aspirations and big dreams in poker, you have to put yourself in the kind of situation where if variance does decide to smack you in the face and give you everything, that you're there to capitalise on it. So you do have to take shots at these games if you have these aspirations. You can't just very slowly and safely, nettily grind your way up. It will just take far too long. You do have to take shots. You do have to game select. You have to embrace a bit of variance if you want to get there. Uh, I think, to be honest, like, um, I would be more likely to, if I was like not knocking on the doors of those goals a year from now to start mixing in more tournament play where I think the opportunity online is much higher and you know also have the option to play all these live tournaments like I say some of them are very very good opportunities as well um and I think I would just make that transition at that point if I was like you know trapped at 200 and you know um 25 510 live yeah. I would probably just start playing tournaments for a change of pace and more opportunity sure Cool. All right, man. Well, that's been a really interesting interview. I wish you all the best in your poker career. It's definitely going in a good direction so far. No reason to think it won't continue to. So yeah. all the best. Cheers very much. We'll have you back on the podcast and see which doors you are knocking on maybe six months yeah. a year from now. See see where you're going. But I have high hopes. So yeah, sounds good. Cool. Thanks for coming on. So for the rest of you guys, um, we'll be back with another podcast in a few weeks' time probably. I'll get some more guests on for you guys to talk a bit more about real poker journeys give you guys a sense of perspective you know poker i like to think of this podcast as real poker life not just the odd like one in one one thousand or ten thousand celebrity players that manage to go on an incredible journey but the common grinder as well and how much success he or she might have um with certain outlooks and approaches so we'll do more of that soon as you can see on there if you're on youtube watching this um these are my books are available on my website if you're listening to this then the website is carrotcorner.com the books are the grinder's manual which is my main textbook that most of my students have read and it's how a lot of them find me as they read it they like it they hire me um it's basically a good introduction to the game but it goes a lot a lot beyond that it's more of a just a solid course book like if poker was your degree this would be your, your course textbook 100 hands i'd recommend getting that afterwards it's a very like intensely detailed more gto based practicals example book they're both available on carrotcorner.com if you buy them there and you want a kindle copy i will send you one so please don't feel that you have to get that on amazon just because you want a Kindle copy, buy the PDF and I will send you a free Kindle. Just email me at admin at caracorner.com and that's the same email address, admin at caracorner.com. If you want to get in touch about the podcast, you know a guest, you want to be a guest, anything like that, I'd love to hear from you guys. I, I like all your feedback. It keeps me going in the right direction, gives me the motivation to do this. So um, thanks again for watching and I will see you guys very soon. Run good.